Stanford University. Hello, it's lecture 12 of Stanford CS193P in spring of 2021. Today we are going to have some slides where we're going to talk about property wrappers, all those at sign things, at sign state, at sign observed object, all those things. And then we're going to have a very big demo, which is going to use a lot of those at sign things, but also it's going to cover a lot of new things, the concepts of which I think you'll just get from seeing the code. Uh, as usual in the demos, I'm just going to be scratching the surface of all this stuff. You're mostly going to learn by doing in your homework and on your final project. And also you'll be checking out the documentation to find out some of the detailed stuff. But let's dive right into this property wrapper thing. These at sign something statements are called property wrappers. A property wrapper is just a struct. And these structs kind of encapsulate some sort of template behavior applied to the bars that they're wrapping. Good examples of at signs are at sign state, at sign publish, at sign observed object. You know what all these things do. So we're going to kind of open up these property wrappers and see what's inside. Mostly there's providing syntactic sugar to make it easier to do things, but they really are essential to making Swift UI work. So we're going to use the example of at sign published here. Here's an at sign published var emoji art is the model of our emoji art document. And let's pick apart what this actually is. I said it's a struct, and it is. And this struct type is the thing the at sign is. So this at sign published var emoji art is going to make a struct of type published. Now this published has a very, very important var inside of it called its wrapped value. It's really the value that it's everything's going to circulate around. Now the type of this wrapped value is the type of the var. The at sign publish var emoji art emoji art. It's that emoji art that's the type of this wrapped value. So that's the starting point kind of struct that's being made when you do this at sign publish thing here. Now Swift makes some other vars available to you as well. One of them is the underbar version of this emoji art bar. So every time you do at sign publish emoji art or any at sign something, you get an underbar version. And the underbar thing is a thing, a var that is of type published. So it's of type that struct up there. So this is where the actual struct is that your at sign published is making. And it's initialized to be creating one of these published structs with its starting value being that starting value you say up there. Now, not all at sign things have a starting value, but um, if they do, then essentially you're getting this behavior right here. So that underbar emoji art, that's the thing that's doing all the work, right? Because it's an instance of this published struct, which is the thing that does all the magic that we know that at sign publish can do. Now, there's also, uh, you can see that flashing up there, the emoji art, emoji art, a computed var that is just getting the wrapped value and setting the wrapped value. And that's the var that you're using. So you think when you say at time publish var emoji art that you're using the var emoji art, but actually that is just a computed value that is getting the wrapped value out of the struct, the underbar struct that was created there. But wait. There's a little bit more. There's another special thing in there called the projected value, which you don't really see, but you're going to be able to access. And this projected value you get by using dollar sign emoji art. So you have underbar emoji art. That's the actual published struct where all the code is that does all the magic. And then you have dollar emoji art. And this dollar emoji art thing is kind of just depends on the at sign published as to what type it is. So in an at sign published case, it is a what's called a publisher. We're going to talk about publishers uh, in an upcoming lecture, but a publisher just publishes the value that's changing uh, kind of on a stream of information. And so that's what is there. And really to understand these at sign you know, property wrapper things, we have to go through and understand, you know, what is their wrapped value and what is their projected value and what do they do? What is their function? So uh, 
let's talk a little bit about that. Of course, at time publish, we really kind of know what it does. When its wrap value changes, it publishes the change through its projected value as dollar emoji R, but we don't really care much too much about that. We don't use the publisher too much, but we also know that it's got code in there that calls object will change dot send in its enclosing observable object. So that is a description of what at sign publish does. Let's go through each of the at sign things that we're going to find, we're going to learn about today and find out what their wrapped value is and what actions they take and what their projected values is. Let's talk about at sign state first. So at sign state's wrapped value is pretty much any value type. We use at sign state bars to have, you know, some value type get put into the heap. And not only put into the heap, but put in the heap in a way that it invalidates the view whenever it changes and causes its body to get reconstructed. And also it lives in the heap in a way such that, uh, you know, as the views are created and destroyed, created and destroyed, as long as the view is staying on screen, the view's body is on screen, that value stays the same. We keep pointing to that same thing in the heap. So that's kind of good magic there. Now the projected value of at sign state, the dollar sign version of your bar, is a binding. And it's a binding to that value in the heap. And we're going to talk all about bindings in a few slides here because bindings are very, very important. One little tricky thing I want to talk about here is if you say at sign state private var something of a certain type, but you don't say equal something, and then you want to initialize it in your init, you have to do initialize the underbar, right? The underbar one, the actual state struct. And you do that by saying underbar foo equals dot init with some initial value there. So that's just something to remember. We don't initialize at sign states in our nits very often, but occasionally we might want to do that. Now there's something you've never heard of before, which is at sign state object. So that's at sign state object is just like at sign state, but it's for observable objects. So if you wanted to have at sign state, at sign state var and the thing was going to be an observable object, you'd be using at sign state object instead. Now, an at sign state object behaves just like at sign observed object, right? All the view and validation and all that stuff, except that an at sign state is a source of truth just like at sign state is for view local information so you're always going to create an at sign state object var by setting it equal to something it's always going to be an equal something after at sign state object var now an at sign observed object is not a source of truth it's a reference to a source of truth so you should never be doing at sign observed object object var foo equals something that would just be wrong uh, because if you're saying equal something you're creating a source of truth and so that can't be in an at sign observed object that belongs in a state object now also you know observed objects could l live in at sign state objects you could have an at sign state which is an array of view models that's allowed that would be kind of interesting because your view models would be pinned to the lifetime of your view but at sign state object can be used uh, in the same way. And at sign state objects exist in views and also in apps and scenes, those things like memorize app and emoji art app, the main part, they can all have at sign state objects. It's pretty common to have at sign state objects in app and scene, a little less common to have them in view. And here's why, because if you put an at sign state object in a view, then its lifetime is tied to the lifetime of the view on screen. So if you create a view model, let's say in an at sign state object inside a view, and once that view goes off screen, then that view model gets destroyed. It's gone. So whatever storage it has is gone. And sometimes this might be what you want. Let's say you had a view model that uh, took a URL and it went off and fetched stuff. Actually, our emoji art document does this, but let's just say you had a view model that that's all it did. And when the view goes off screen, you want to throw away those bits, bits you fetch. You don't want to cache them or keep them around. You just want to throw them away. And if that view came back on screen, you would want to refetch them. So it's essentially like a little lazy image loader. That is something that you probably do want the lifetime of it to live with the view. That view goes off screen, you want that view model and its bits of the image data that it might have fetched to be thrown away.
But a lot of times it's not what you want. And a lot of times people make mistakes where they are creating an assigned state object in a view and then it's getting passed around to other views that aren't children of that view. And so it's kind of undefined now what's going to happen when that view goes away. Do these other views, they're, they have these outside observed objects that are observing some state object in a view that's now gone. So you got to be a little bit uh, careful how you use an at sign state object. Mostly we're going to, you'll see in the apps we're doing, we put all our at sign state objects up in app in you know, that top level memorize app, emoji art app. That's what we've been doing so far. We haven't marked them at sign state object because I haven't had a chance to explain to you that generally where we put them, but it's not necessarily wrong to put them in a view. Just remember that the lifetime is, is connected to the lifetime of the view. All right, so let's talk about the property wrappers at sign state object and at sign observed object. That wrapped value is anything that implements the observable protocol. That's what the wrap value is, basically a view model. So that's why you always say at sign state object some bar equals a view model. And that's why at sign observed object is in views and people pass a view model in as an argument to set the uh, value of that. And what is that struct? called state object or the struct called observable observed object do? Well, it invalidates the view whenever the wrapped value, that view model, has object will change.send happen on it. The projected value of a state object or observed object is a binding to the vars inside the view model. Remember, at sign state, its projected value is a binding to that at sign state value that got moved to the heap. Well, in state object and observed object, it's a binding to the vars. And it's more than just a binding just to the top level vars. You can actually follow the vars down and even do subscripts. So like this dollar sign my view model dot data dot stuff sub three, that's a perfectly value or uh, perfectly legal dollar sign or binding that you can do through the observed object my view model there and that's really powerful to be able to follow down even into subscripts because you can bind to things deep inside a view model's data structures again binding super important so let's talk about binding because there's an at sign binding as well in an app sign binding the wrapped value is a value that's bound to something else. That is the wrapped value. When you say outside binding var foo of some type, that binding, the value of that foo is coming from somewhere else, usually an at sign state or an at sign state object or some view model somewhere. You've seen that at sign state and uh, these view model ones can, their dollar signs are binding. So that's usually where you're getting a binding. Now, what does this binding struct do? Well, it gets and sets the value of that thing that it's bound to, uh, to always keep them in sync. The other thing a binding does, really important, it invalidates the view. If a view has a var that is marked with at sign binding, then if that thing that it's bound to changes, the view gets invalidated and the body gets rebuilt. Just like if a state object changes, then it gets invalidated. Or if a view model does, object will change.send, uh, it gets invalidated. Same thing here. If a bindings, the value that is bound to changes, it invalidates the view. Now, the projected value, the dollar sign value of a binding is a binding to the binding. So you can use this to if you have a binding to something and you want to call a function that takes another binding, well, you can pass a binding to your own binding and it was binding back to the original thing. So we can keep binding to bindings to bindings perfectly lossless. We just keep on connecting to that original source. So where do we use bindings? Well, we use them all over the place. Here's a whole t list here, getting text out of a text field, using a toggle or state other state modifying UI element. Uh, finding which item in a navigation view is chosen, finding out whether we're being targeted with a drag. Remember that argument to the drag that we just set to nil and I told you you'd have to trust me, I'd tell you later. Well, I'm telling you later, that is targeted thing. That's a binding to uh, some value so that you can find out when your thing was targeted. Um, that thing, the dot updating when we're doing our gesture state, 
that dollar sign thing, that was a binding to our gesture state. Uh, we use it to know about when we're putting alerts and uh, popovers and stuff on screen, we get a binding that tells us whether it's on screen or not all the time. Uh, we use bindings all the time to break our views into smaller pieces. We want to define views that just work on a piece of data, and that piece of data will be bound to some source of truth somewhere else and so many other places. So binding is it's super important. You're gonna be amazed. How did we get all the way through week, five weeks of this without even talking about binding? And we're kind of very carefully covered topics, so we wouldn't, but now we're gonna start using bindings all the time. Bindings exist so that we can have a single source of truth. We don't ever have to duplicate our state or copy it into a var inside a view or something because that view can always just have a binding to the actual source of truth somewhere. So let me show you an example, a simple example of using a binding to bind two views together. So I've got two views here on this screen, my view and other view. And my view has some at sign state. You see it there, my string. It's just just normal at sign state. And when that changes, of course, it's going to rebuild the body of my view. Inside of my view's body, there is another view called other view. And it passes as an argument to this other view, a dollar sign of my string. In other words, a binding to my string state. And this other view, its var, the shared text var, is an at sign binding. And so now, this my string has been bound to this shared text in other view. And it works both ways. If shared text changes in other view, that's going to change my string up in my view. And vice versa, if my string up in my view changes, that's going to change the shared text down in other view. That's as simple as that. We're just binding two variables together. The at sign state at the top is the source of truth, and the shared text at the bottom is just a binding to it, an alias for it, a link to it, however you want to uh, think about it. Notice also that other view in its body is using a text field and that it passes a binding to its own binding, a dollar shared text right there, to the text field. That's because a text field takes a binding to the string that you want to be editing. So this shared text binding that's handed off to the text field is now bound back through another binding to the original source of truth, which is my string, that at sign state bar. This is what I mean when I say that we can have bindings to bindings that they're passed around to different views. So bindings, uh, you can also have constant, what are called constant bindings, and that binds to a constant value, a value that's not going to change. Whenever you ask for the value of the binding, it always gets the same value. Uh, these are useful, especially like when you're setting up preview and things, uh, you know, your preview code to bind it to some constant value that will try out your UI. There's also something called a computed binding. And this is a binding where the, the constructor, the initializer for it is, give me a set function and give me a get function. And the get function goes out and gets the value of this binding and the set value sets the value. So you can kind of create your own bindings to arbitrary sources of data by just providing a function that goes and gets the data and then also providing a function that can set the data. I'm not gonna talk about computer bindings, but they're kind of interesting. Uh, we probably use them 5% of the time, but when we do use them, they can be quite valuable. All right, that's it for binding. We're gonna see this in the demo all over the place. The next property wrapper I want to talk about is assign environment object. This is exactly the same as assign observed object. In other words, it's a reference to an observable object, but it's passed to the view in a different way. Instead of passing it as an argument, like the view model argument or whatever to a view, you pass it by using a view modifier called environment object. And then inside the view, instead of saying assign observed object, for the view model, you say at sign environment object bar for the view model. So otherwise the code would be exactly the same. All we're doing is passing that view model in a little bit differently. So what's the big difference between the two? The environment objects are visible to all the views in your body and then all the views in their bodies all the way down. So 
we often use this way to pass a view modeling if it's going to be used by a whole scattering of views in our entire view hierarchy we don't want to have to be passing the them by name you know by arguments into each one especially if we're having to pass them through one that's not even going to use it just so it can get down to one at the next level so environment object you can kind of think it injects it into all the views so any view inside that whole view hierarchy that says at sign environment object can see that thing now there is one restriction for environment object which is that you can only have one at sign environment object injected into a view hierarchy per type of observable object you know like in emoji art we have two view models two observable objects we got the store and we've got then the emoji art document well you can only inject inject one of each of them in there we couldn't in inject two stores in there it just doesn't work because you could be look at at sign environment object there var view model it, it just says that type view model class there can only be one so if you tried to inject two i don't know i guess the, either the first one would win or the second one would win but they can't both be in there so that is one restriction of at sign environment object if you needed to pass two separate stores in you would have to either make a new view model that includes them both or you'd have to pass them as arguments in the old-fashioned way into a, at sign observable objects so at sign environment object what's the wrap value it's an observable object obtained from dot environment object being injected into that view and what does at sign environment object do eh, the same thing as at sign observed object it invalidates the view when the wrap value does its little object will change dot send and what's its projected value again the same as at sign observed object and at sign state object it is a binding to the bars of that view model including the subscripting and all that stuff we talked about okay the next property wrapper is at sign environment this is totally unrelated to at sign environment object completely and utterly different they look so similar but they're completely different all right this is the at sign environment no object on there to explain this one i have to explain that property wrappers can have more variables than just that wrapped value and projected value the dollar sign thing and the then the main value they're just normal structs and so they can have arguments when you create them and we do that we use that argument when we create an at sign environment property wrapper and we specify that argument in parentheses after it and in the case of at sign environment this argument is a key path basically the name of a var in something called the environment values struct when you're done with these slides you're going to want to go into the documentation and read everything about environment values you're going to look at all the keys there all the uh, bars in there so you can see what is possible so what is good about this environment values thing or what do you use it for well this environment values thing is a bunch of environment a bunch of variables for what's going on in the while your view is drawing let me just use an example here which is color scheme color scheme is in the environment values struct and it tells you whether you're in dark mode or light mode if you're running if you have your views code and it wants to know am i in light mode or in dark mode it's going to use at sign environment backslash dot color scheme like you see right there to find out it's going to do that line of code and now color scheme is going to be an enum with dark and light and you can just look at it and check and we're going to see in the demo we can even inject values into the environment if we want if we wanted to fool a view into thinking it's in dark mode even though the device is in light mode we could do that because there is a view modifier which we'll see in the demo that sets the values of these things as well at sign environment the property wrapper its wrapped value is some var in environment values and what does it do it lets you get that var basically and it has no projected value so you can't bind to it in fact if you have an environment value that you need to bind to then the type of the environment value has to be a binding and there are a couple like that i'm even going to show you them in the demo and the only tricky thing about that is when you're accessing those kinds of environment values that are bindings you have to say dot wrapped value if you want to get the wrapped value out of there all right that's it for property wrappers those are all the property wrappers uh, that we're going to talk about there are more but these are the main ones 
So now it's humongous demo time. We're going to talk about popovers and text fields and forms and navigation view and edit mode and all the, these at time environment, all these things. It's a big, big demo. And uh, I can tell you again, we're going to go a little bit over time. This week is one week where we have to cover a lot of ground in the two lectures. Uh, I'll try to keep it as close as possible to on time. Today's demo is all about putting views on screen. So far, we've built apps that pretty much had a single view, emoji art here, or memorize, of course, the game view. And now we want to start building things that have multiple screens. And the conduit for us to learn about this today is going to be this palette chooser right here. We saw this at, when I first showed you emoji art. It's got multiple palettes to choose from. I'm just tapping on this little control button here, and it's cycling through them. But I can also press and hold and bring up this context menu. So we're going to learn how to do that. And even go to brings up another menu that we can use to go to where we want. But this also has this edit menu item right here that brings up a little popover. This is a small little view that is pointing at another view, pointing at the thing it's editing. And we have a full interface here for editing this palette. We can also manage the palettes. It shows us all of our palettes. We can move them around, change them into a different order. We can delete some, maybe we can delete uh, animal faces right there. And when we're done editing, we can even tap on them to navigate to a completely different view. So this navigation that you've seen, I'm sure, in iOS apps is something we're also going to learn how to do today. We'll also learn a little bit of other stuff, alerts and some other things, but there's a lot to cover today, so I'm gonna dive right in. The first thing I'm gonna do is go over here to where we have these test emojis from our last version of Emoji Art, and I'm gonna move all this into its own view called Palette Chooser, and then we'll eventually enhance Palette Chooser more and more to have all these features. So here's the code from emoji art document view they did palettes there wasn't a lot of it here i'm going to cut it and then go up to file new file create a new swift ui view palette chooser and palette chooser is just going to have all this code i just cut out of there a lot of this we can possibly remove we don't really need that let's take this scroll and then put it in here as the main part we can keep our test emojis for now down here in my scrolling emojis view by the way i'm going to add one small thing which is i'm using this self as my identifier for our emojis so i'm going to put a little thing here that makes sure that i have no duplicate characters just because i wouldn't want to have that if i'm using self as the identifier there and we're also going to need some variables to keep track of the font we're going to use to draw the emojis in the palette. All right, I think I've successfully transferred this over here to palette chooser. So now I can go back to my document view. And where I used to have this little var palette that I was using, I'll just put a palette chooser here. And it wants the emoji font size, which will be my default emoji font size. Let's run and make sure we haven't broken anything by putting that in its own view. Excellent, still working. Got our test emojis here. First step I'm going to do is to get rid of the test emojis and start pulling things out of our model. Our model for this whole thing is that palette store that we worked on in the last lecture. So let's go grab something out of our store instead of using this test emojis. That means that our palette chooser is going to need that store. Now we could pass it into it as another argument here in addition to the emoji font size but instead i'm going to do it using this thing we learned about in lecture the environment object create a var that's the store it's of type palette store and this is going to be passed to me by being injected into my view but i'm going to inject it not at this level where I'm creating palette user, I'm going to inject it all the way back up here in my app. So here's my app up here. Here's where I'm creating the palette store. I'm going to inject this right here, environment object with palette store. And that injects it into my emoji art document view and all the views in its body, including 
the palette chooser. So this is going to appear everywhere in there, really convenient for passing it down the way because Emoji Art Document View doesn't actually use the palette store, but this passes it on through to the chooser, which does. While I'm here, by the way, I'm going to change these lets to be at sign state object bars. You saw this in the slides today. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this primarily so that I could grab at sign state here and go to my search window and find everywhere I have a source of truth, either an at sign state in a view or an at sign state object here, which are creating both my view models. I have two MVVMs essentially, and these are the two view models for it. So now that we've injected this palette store, it comes all the way through to this environment object, I can start using the store here to, for example, show something from the store instead of my test emojis. So let's create a little palette bar here, which is just gonna be asking my store for the palette. Let's say at zero to start. I'll put that palettes emojis in here. Don't need my test emojis anymore if I do that. While we're at it, we might as well put the palettes name here as well. So let's do a little H stack with a text of the palettes name along with this scrolling emojis in the palette itself. Take a look at that. There it is. The face is right there. There's the zero with one right there. Let's go maybe look at the third one, which is number two. It's weather. That's working just fine. But we want to be able to cycle through these, so let's add this little palette control button right here. I'm going to add a bar for that, bar palette control button. It's a button. What's it going to do? Well, it has to cycle this number right here, two, three, four, five, all the way up to the max and then back down to zero. So I'm going to need some at sign state private var chosen palette index equals zero. And this is going to be the bar I'm going to cycle through. So I'll replace that here, chosen palette index. And down here, I'll just say that that chosen palette index equals the chosen palette index plus one. But I've got to cycle around and come back to zero. So I'm going to mod that time to store palette count. And we need a label on here, of course. The label that you're seeing over here is just an SF symbol for this paint palette image system name paint palette and i want this button to be same size as all the scrolling emojis so let's set the font to be emoji font remember that image system name sizes itself based on the font that's set on it now let's put this control button along with this h stack into our body to make that look nice i'm going to create a funk here body for palette takes a palette that we want to show some view and put this H stack right here in there. Now we can have our main body be another H stack that has our palette control button and the body for this palette right here. Very nice code here. Everything nicely organized into little sub bars and things like that. Hopefully does what we want. Here we go. Tap. Yes. Tap, tap, tap. It's cycling through. Does it go back to the beginning? Yes, it does. All the way around and around. Very good. We've made a lot of progress. We're really getting close already. One thing I do notice, however, though, is when I tap, oh, it just jumps. Whereas over here, when I tap, oh, a nice smooth rolling animation here. So how do we do this roll animation instead of jumpiness? I think maybe we could just do something like, oh, let's put with animation around the changing of the palette. See if that fixes the problem. All right, tap. Oh, well, things are moving around, but they're kind of fading and sliding. They're not doing this roll. And why are they rolling like this? Well, this roll is a custom animation that I built. And I did it as a transition, essentially as each one of these little palette views 
goes away and a new one appears, it just slides up from the bottom and then slides up the top to go away. So that's a transition animation that I'm doing there. Let's define that little transition animation. I called it my roll transition. It's an any transition. I'm returned it directly here. It's any transition. It's an asymmetric transmission transition because it's going up from the bottom, but it leaves at the top. So they're not going to and from the same place when they transition. Both of them, though, are an offset transition. Neither of them offset at all horizontally. But when things are arriving, when we're inserting, then the offset is by, I picked the emoji font size, which seemed to be a good size to transition uh, with. And then offsetting the other way is almost exactly the same, except for we're going the opposite way. So it's emoji font size with the minus in front. Now, how do I use this roll transition? I just made this H stack that is the body for a given palette. That's my text name and the scrolling emojis. I made it transition to use this roll transition. So simple. Now let's see if that worked just like this. All right, tap. Oh, it did nothing. It's totally ignoring this transition. Why is it not transitioning? Well, the answer is that there's no actual transition going on here. When I tap and it changes the palette right here, this H stack is not leaving the screen and a new one coming on. All these things are just getting updated. The palette name is changing. The emojis here are changing. So it's just changing the existing view. Nothing is transitioning. So oh, can I just not use a transition? Because it's so convenient to have this transition, this offset transition. Well, of course I can. We're going to do a little trick, which is there is a way to tag a view. And when the tag on the view changes, it removes it and replaces it with a new one. And the way you do it is .id. And it's really just like identifiables. You're making this view kind of have its identifiable, just like it kind of would in a for each. And so when the identifiable changes, this thing is going to change. It's going to be replaced with a new view with the new identifier. And we have this convenient palette ID lying around. Every palette is unique. It's identifiable. So let's use the same thing. So now we are going to be transitioning and we are going to see this roll. Here we go. Woo, it is rolling. However, it's kind of going up there and then disappearing. Well, that's not really what we want. I actually don't mind that it's disappearing, but I don't want to see it. So when I do it over here, notice I don't get to see it coming up here. It just kind of is hidden by the edge of this view. Well, we've seen this before. When we were having our emoji art and we could zoom it out, it was smashing into other views. And that's exactly what's happening here. It's just smashing into this other view. We just need to clip this. Let's put a clipping on this view, that's all. Let's go up here and say dot clipped run and bingo working just like we want next step this context menu that's the next thing we want to do now the context menu is remarkably simple all we need to do is find out what view it is we want the context menu to come up from which is our palette control button right here and we just say dot context menu and inside here we put a list of views. This is a view builder in here. We can put whatever views we want, and for each view, it'll make an entry in the menu. I'm going to make another var for this. And this is some view. I want this to be a view builder as well, so I'm going to do at sign view builder. Now, in here is going to go all these buttons that we saw over here. These things are all buttons that are going to appear in there. And I, since I'm going to be doing so many of these, I created a nice little utility view to do that called animated action button. This, the body of this is just one button. That's it. It happens to animate the action that you pass to it. So it's an animated action button. And the title can be just both a title and an image, in which case we're going to use this new view you've never seen before called a label. All of these things over here are labels. 
Labels have a title and, in this case, a system image, but they can have your own image as well. But this animated action button also works if you just do a title or just do a system image, but most of the time we're going to be providing both a title and a system image, and it's going to use a label here. So this animated action button is what I'm going to use for all of the things in my context menu. So let's add some of those. Animated action button. First one I'm going to do is new. And it's going to use the system image, which is plus sign. And what do we do when we hit new? We're going to insert palette named. This is just a intent function in our store, if you'll remember from last time. And we'll call it new. That's the name of the pal that I'm inserting. It's going to start with no emojis. I'm going to put it at the chosen palette index. That's what, where we currently are, right? This is our private our state right there. So that's new. How about also delete? It's another one. So let's do delete. The image for delete is minus in a circle. And what am I going to do here? Not insert a palette. I'm going to ask the store to remove the palette at the chosen palette index. I did a nice thing. When you remove a palette, this intent function will also return to you the new chosen palette index to use because you might have deleted, say, the last thing in the palette and now you're pointing at the last thing and it's gone. So now this will wrap you around to zero. So it's just kind of convenience right here. That's all we really need to do to build a menu. Just list the buttons that we want to put in there. And let's give it a look. Oh, press and hold at work. There it is, new and delete. Let's try new. Oh, it added new. Cycle around. Is new in there? Yeah, it did. It added new. And we could also, let's say, delete the new. So I hit delete. It's gone. No more new in here. Well, that was incredibly easy to add things to our context menu. What should we do next? How about we do this go to? This is one of my favorite little ones where we can just zoom quickly to whichever thing we want. Let's do that one. I'm going to do that as a separate little thing here. Go to menu, I'm going to call it. And I'm just listing views here, right? Here's one view, two views, three views. And so this is going to be var go to menu. It is some view, of course. This view is going to be a menu view. So menu view is kind of what is going on in here. But the menu view has a label. And our label is going to be one of these label things I just told you about. It's going to say go to. We'll use the system image for go to to be a text.insert. Seemed like even though we're not inserting text, that icon seems very similar to what's happening here when we're going to something in a list. You'll see when we go get back there. And in this menu, we want to list all of our other palettes, right? This is the go-to menu. This is the label to the go-to menu. And when we choose it, this is all of our other palettes, okay? So we need to list them here. I'm going to do a for each on all my store's palettes. And for each of the palettes in there, I'm going to create an animated action button. Its title is the name of the palette. Simple. And if you choose it, I need to find the index of this palette right here in my store so I can set my chosen palette index to that. So I'm going to say if I can let index equal my store's palettes first index uh, where... <laughs> A uh, dollar zero ID equals the palette ID. You're probably uh, really used to doing that from your assignment so far. I told you that I created a nice little uh, convenience method for this. Let's look at that at the top here. Here it is, index matching. I added it to all collections where the elements in the collection are identifiable. And you can just say index matching one of the elements, and it'll return you the index. Let's use that one here instead, just for a little bit of cleanliness. Index matching that palette. And if I find that index, I'm going to set my chosen palette index equal to that index. What do we need to do? Let's go look at that. Press and hold. Go to. Oh, 
weather nice press and hold go to sport okay let's keep trucking along here the next one i want to do is how about edit brings up a whole new popover window here with some ui that allows me to edit this thing so how are we going to do this the key to this is we're going to build a view that is this entire view right here. Then we'll simply ask SwiftUI, please put it up in a little popover that points at this other view. So how do we do both of those things? Let's start building this view right here. It's going to be a completely new view, so file new. It is a SwiftUI view. I'm going to call it my palette editor. That's what it does, right? Edit a palette. Now, notice it appeared in the wrong place. This is because I wasn't careful about where I stored it. So I want to pick it up and drag it so it's in the right place here inside the folders. Let's bring up our preview so we can see what we're doing as we're building this. Previewing on iPad here, so it's a little hard to see. It's kind of tiny because iPads are big. I'm going to show you how to fix this in a minute here, but let's focus a little bit on getting started with the UI. And we do want some text in our palette editor, just to remind you what the palette editor looks like. It looks like this. And so there is text, like the name. Let's, let's focus on the name here. Let's try to get this name editable text right here so we can click on this and edit the name with the keyboard here. How are we gonna do that? Uh, instead of hello world, how about if we try and put like a palette name here. You would need some sort of palette. Well, let's just create some outside state for it, I guess, to start. And I will, why don't I just grab one out of some random store that I created. So I'm gonna create a little test store and then grab the palette at, let's say, number two or something like that. I'm only doing this to have a palette to work with so I can look at it and see what's going on. Let's see what that looks like. So there it is. You can hardly see it, but it does say weather right there. So that's good. So it is getting number two. This is just text that's printed out, though. I need text that's editable. So how do I make editable text? Well, there's a different view called text field. It takes two arguments. The first one is what we call the placeholder text for this text field. It's the text that'll appear kind of grayed out inside the text field when there's no text in there. So if the user hasn't typed anything in this text field, they'll still see this kind of gray placeholder text in the background. It's usually an explanation of what you're supposed to type in this text field. And then the second argument is called text, and this is the text we're editing. Now I do want to edit this palette's name, this palette's name in here, but I can't just say palette name because this is a string and there's no way for the text field to do anything except for display this string. So this is where we pass a binding. Now I'm going to bind the text that's being edited right over here to the name field in this at sign state. Remember that at sign state their projected value, the thing you do with the dollar, is a binding to the at sign state. And that when we bind to an at sign state or to an observed object, we can go look at its bars as well and bind to its bars. So when I edit this text over here, which I can do by clicking, it's, uh, I'll just put it in live preview mode here. And I'm gonna click, and if I start typing either center or something, it doesn't really matter that you can't see that. That is actually changing that in this state. Just We are bound to this actual state. Now, the next thing we want to do is get this up on screen in our main apps UI right here. But before we do that, I'm going to do a couple of things. One, notice that I'm always displaying this in a little rectangle on the screen. At worst, I play, displayed it in that big manage rectangle. I'm never having it fill the whole screen, kind of like what's going on in my preview. And when you have a view like this that you're only displaying in little rectangles, you can actually change your preview to show it to you that way. So I'm going to bring up the inspector for the preview here and go down to my palette editor. 
And the layout here, I'm going to choose, instead of laying out inherited, which is going to be the device, I'm going to pick fixed. So fixed is going to add a fixed size. I'm going to do 300 by 350, let's say. It's showing me this in that fixed size. And I can now zoom in and see what's going on. Now, it, this weather makes a lot more sense what's going on here. And I know that this is nothing like what I want this thing to look like. I do not want this with this text field over here smashed up against the edge and all that. I want it to look like this, where it's got a nice gray background and the name field is white. It's got a little slight border. I want all that. So how do I get all that? Well, one word in Swift UI, form. If you put your things in a form, you get this look. And this is a standard look for forms that have different pieces of information that you're trying to gather. This is one of the most powerful views in all of Swift. You saw we put this one word in here and all of a sudden we start getting something that it's all organized and laid out nicely, et cetera. And we're going to see how to put titles on these sections and all that stuff. All right now that we've got this looking a lot better, let's uh, try and get it on screen from our little palette control button down here. We want an edit menu item in here that puts that up. So how are we going to get a men edit menu item that puts this thing on screen? Back to our palette chooser. And let's find our view that wants to put that thing up, which is our body down here. So when we edit it, this body is showing the view that we want to edit. So this is the thing that wants to put that little popover up. Whichever view puts that popover up is the thing it's going to point to when you bring it up. You see how it's got a little triangle? It's pointing to this view. That's the view it points to. So this is clearly the view we want to put that thing up. How do we put it up? Well, first let's just put up a big sheet on a screen, a little a rectangle. We'll do the thing with the little arrow in a second. To do this with the view modifier sheet, you say is presented. And this takes a binding to some variable that is a Boolean. And if that Boolean is true, then it's gonna put whatever view is in here, like our palette editor, on screen in a big rectangle. So this editing is just going to be some at sign state, private var editing, starts out false. Whenever this is false, this is not on screen. Whenever this is true, this will be on screen. That is all that's going on here. Could not be a simpler way to get that rectangle on screen. All we have to do is set this, we'll do that up here in our context menu. Put the edit, how about at the top? And it's edit in the system image for edit. I think I did pencil. And this just sets that editing to true. By the way, when we create a new one, create this blank, and we probably want the editing to be true here as well. We want that sheet to come up as well and edit this new. So we'll have both of them set that editing to true. And that setting the editing true is going to cause this view, whatever's inside this closure, to appear. Let's see it happen. Here we go. Press and hold. Edit. Ah, there it is. Weather. Oh, weather. Wait a second. This was faces. How come when I went here and I said edit, it's showing me weather? Well, I'll talk about that in a minute. But I also told you we could point at the view that brought us up and put that big screen up. Well, instead of sheet, which is the big rectangle, you can do popover. And we choose edit. Oh, it, it, well, it is pointing at it. And I think that's gonna say weather right there, but this is so small, we can't see anything. So why is this so small? Well, popovers, when they go up, they make themselves as small as they can and still fit what's inside. Well, fitting what's inside kind of depends on what's in there. And especially if it's a form, you don't quite know how much space to allow. Luckily, it's very easy for a view like our palette editor right here to say that their frame has a minimum width, let's say of 300, 
and a minimum height, let's say 350 or something like that. And it'll enforce these minimums so that that popover won't be so small. Now notice I picked even the same numbers that I was using for my preview. These have nothing to do with each other. This is just how we're laying out our preview. This is the frame that we're actually going to enforce a minimum of uh, on screen. And we saw a dot frame before. Uh, I don't remember, We I think we use actual width and height instead of minimum width and height, but there are other arguments to frame. Frame is essentially controlling how big your frame is going to be. See that happen. And here we go, press and hold, edit. Ah, very nice. Now that is working just about perfectly, except that this is the faces palette and it's editing the weather one. Why is that not the same? Well, in our palette editor, we are only editing palette number two, which is weather. Clearly the palette editor doesn't want to just edit some state of its own. It wants to edit the state from our model. This is in our model. We want to edit this palette over here that's in the model. So how can this view edit something in the model? It's going to have, instead of state, a binding to our model. This is one of the most important things I've ever typed in this course, is this word binding right here. This is going to allow this editor to edit a palette that is somewhere else, namely in our model. And the palette editor does not care where it is. There's nothing about palette store in here. We're not doing environment object palette store, nothing. This just knows it's editing a palette that is somewhere else. That's what this binding means right here. Notice also that we didn't have to change that dollar sign palette dot name down in the text field. And that's because the projected value, the dollar sign of an at sign binding is the binding itself. So that text field is binding through our binding back to wherever the source of truth is. Now you can see this has caused a problem in our preview provider because this palette, someone has to give it to you. The editor can't work without this binding being set right here. By the way, we never say binding equals something. Bindings are always passed to us by definition. We are binding to something else. So I'll fix this later. In the meantime, I'm just gonna put a text here that says, fix me, comment this out. We'll come back to this, but let's go back to our palette chooser where we create our palette editor and pass the binding into this thing. So here's our palette chooser. Here's where we do our palette editor. If I build here, you can see there's an error that says palette editor initializer is inaccessible due to private protection level. See that private protection level? That's because a binding cannot be private. By definition, other views have to be able to set this, so do not make these private. And now if we go back to the palette chooser and build, it says missing argument for parameter palette in call. And indeed there is a different missing argument. So what is the palette that we really want to edit here? It is the one at the chosen palette index. So we're going to say dollar sign store dot palettes at the chosen palette index. This dollar sign store is creating a binding into this view model right here. So environment objects, just like observed objects and state objects, they can all be bound into. When you bind into them, you can access their vars and even do subscripts like this. And it will look this subscript up when it is binding to here. Now a binding, remember, is just getting and setting a value. So every time this value changes, it will be gotten by our palette editor. And every time our palette editor changes this palette, because it can edit the name and the emojis and stuff, then this will set this thing at this index. So there's no copying going on. It's going to actually follow this uh, subscript to go and set the value. So now let's run and see if our editor is editing the thing we've chosen. Go and edit. Oh, it's faces. Let's go to something else. Maybe not weather. Let's go to animal faces and edit. There's animal faces. Now it's more than that. Watch if we go here and edit, you can see that the changes are directly appearing in the model. That's because this text fields text 
has been at sign binding to the name field in the palette in the model. So any changes we make here in the text are going to appear down here in the model and vice versa. That's what a binding is all about. This model over here that we're seeing is the source of truth. It's the source of truth for this view. It's the source of truth for this text field because they're, it's bound to that source of truth. Now we're going to fill out this UI and add the ability to add emojis or remove emojis. But before I do that, I want to show you another way to bring this popover up. Currently, we bring it up using this Boolean. This Boolean editing brings this palette editor up. But there's another way to bring up popovers and sheets, which I want to show you because it might even be the preferred way instead of doing this Boolean, which is to have some at sign state that is an optional. So for example, what if I had palette to edit, which is a palette optional. And if you have an optional state that you are going to do this on, the way it works, and I'll go ahead and copy and paste so you can see the old one side by side with the new one, is that instead of doing is presented in Boolean, you do item colon and this optional, but you bind to it in exactly the same way you bind to the bool there. You're going to bind to this optional. And it's going to hand you this thing back inside of this closure, which is different than this one. This one doesn't need to hand you anything because it's just a bool. You already know you wouldn't be here if it's not true or false. But here, when this becomes non-nil, it's going to call this closure with the non-nil values. So this will never be nil in here. Whenever this is nil, this is not on screen. Whenever it's not nil, this is on screen, and this is the value of the thing. The only restriction on this thing is that it has to be identifiable. That's so that the sheet or the popover can tell not only when this thing has changed from nil to not being nil or vice versa, but also when it's changed to be a different thing. So this is a super way to put popovers and sheets up, especially because instead of just saying editing is false somewhere, I'm going to comment that out as well, up here, you're going to say what you're editing. So I'm going to say that the palette to edit in this case equals my stores palette at my chosen palette index. When I click on this, I'm going to get the palette I'm currently looking at and say that this is the palette I want to edit. Same thing down here. So this way, the sheet is really coming up with more semantically sensible driver here. It's being driven by the palette you actually want to edit. And so then in here, you're not doing all this store palettes to chosen index. I'm going to do the store palettes at the index of the palette. This is kind of an interesting piece of code right here because I'm indexing my palettes with another palette. This is the thing we talked about in lecture and that I added some code in my utility extensions, which is I added a subscript to range replaceable collections where the elements are identifiable that you can actually pass one of the identifiables and it'll work, it'll look it up, it'll look up the index matching it and do it, and it'll just do nothing if it's not in there. So if you actually subscript off of something and that identifiable is not in the range replaceable collection, this kind of does nothing. It's not gonna crash your app or do anything else, it just has no effect. This is kind of the exact same thing as looking up index matching or first index where the things are the same. It's doing that for you as part of the subscripting here. But notice that if you do subscript that way, it says subscript of that type has to be hashable. And this is part of how it constructs these little vars when you bind to something. This needs to be hashable. It's no problem for us. We can go back to our store where palette is defined up here and just say that palettes are hashable. Swift will do the actual implementation of hashable for us because all of these things are hashable. So this is a little bit cleaner code than just doing these bools. I recommend doing you know, a, something that can be nil if it's sensible. I mean, sometimes it's just not sensible. For example, when we do the manager, we're gonna have to do that and have it popping things up. We're gonna go back to using the bool because there's just nothing sensible to make optional. Let's make sure that still works. 
go. We'll go here and edit. And we're editing faces. Tap around. Go back to animal faces. Edit that. There it is, animals faces. Notice that it remembered animals faces that I edited in there because our palette store is making itself persistent in user defaults. So now let's go back and make our little edit window look more like this. Have a little section for adding emojis and a section uh, for removing emojis here. Go back to my palette editor over here. Uh, let's get my preview working. Right now our preview is just gonna say, fix me. So we need to fix it. And to fix this thing here, we need to have our palette editor pass a binding to a palette. Yikes, how are we going to, we don't have any at sign state here to bind to. So how, how can we do this? This is where constant bindings really come in handy. I'm going to have a constant binding to some palette. So again, I'm going to use my trick of just using uh, kind of maybe a special preview palette store or whatever. I'm going to get the palette at uh, four or something like that. And that is just going to be constant palette that uh, palette store that I pass in there for testing only. So it's the animal faces one. Now, since this is constant binding, this editor is not actually going to be able to edit it. So we're really only going to be able to see the layout using this constant binding. So we have our name section right here, and we need to add another section for uh, emojis. One thing that's cool about forms is they actually can have formal sections. So if you put a section in there and you can put a pet header, which is just any view, so I'll have this be my name section. And then inside the names section, you can put whatever UI you want, and that's how you get these little titles named. Usually when we're doing a form like this, I like to put name section which is just some view in its own little bar down here, and then put just inside my form, name section. So then I can say add emojis section, which is the next section I want. And I go down here and say add emojis section, which is some view. I can put that in here. This is just gonna be again, a section with a header, text. This is add emojis, and in here, we're going to add emojis, and we're going to add emojis by another text field. This one, not going to have any little placeholder prompt right there. And the text is kind of interesting. So this has to be a binding. We know this is going to be a binding to some text. What did a binding to, though? I can't really bind to anything in my palette because this text field is just to add emojis. This is not like if I put, if I bound it to palette.emojis, all my emojis would be in this one thing. I don't want that. I just want to be able to add emojis here, incrementally add a couple of emojis. I don't want to have the, all my emojis in there. So I'm really going to have to bind to some local state. I'm going to create add sign state, private var, you know, emojis to add or something like that. And we'll start out with no emojis to add. I'm going to bind here to that. So sometimes when you're building a UI, you're just binding to some local state, and then you're going to have to do something when this state changes. Right? When this state changes in some way, then I'm going to actually take these emojis out of this string and add it to my palette.emojis up here. And well, how do I do that? When am I going to do that? Well, text field has some things built into itself for doing that, like on commit is an argument you can give the text field, and it'll execute this when the user hits the return key, which really works great when you have a hardware keyboard on your device, but most people don't have that, and so they're not really hitting the keyboard much, so that's not anything of much value for us there. Uh, there's another one called on editing changed, which uh, takes something that has a little argument here, began in, and that one is when you start editing or end editing. And this Boolean is began says whether you're starting or ending. So you could argue that we could grab this emojis to add when you ended editing, but that's really not that valuable either. So neither of the things that text field offers really help. What I decided I wanted, instead of having that add button that you saw in the other version, I wanted every time you typed typed a character in, I wanted it to add it to the emojis in the palette. How can I do that? Well, that's essentially every time this changes, I want to do it. So 
You can do that with a really cool view modifier that works on all views, not just text fields. It's called on change of. And on change of, you just specify any of your vars, your stat sign state or your view model or whatever. And then when it changes, it's going to give you the emojis that during the emojis to add at the time. And you can do something. So this is essentially watching this. And every time this changes, boom, it executes this closure and hands you the newest value of it. So here I can do, you know, add emojis and add these emojis to my uh, palette. So I need to funk down here, add emojis, which takes some emojis to the string and adds it to my palette. How am I going to do that? Easy. My emojis equals these emojis you want to add plus what's already in my palette. But I'm going to be careful here to only add emojis. So I'm going to filter out things that aren't emojis. This little is emoji is something I added over in my uh, uh, utility extensions there. And I'm also going to do that removing um, duplicate characters thing we saw, because if you add one that's already there, I don't want a duplicate of it. And I'm also going to do this with animation. I want it, those new ones to nicely animate appearing in the UI. Now we're going to go run and see this, but I do want to talk one more thing about text field. It has some other things that you should be aware of. I'm not going to go through them all. We're already completely time crunched in this thing, but it has things like keyboard type. You can do web search keyboard, for example. Uh, it has um, uh, auto capitalization, whether it does the automatic capitalization on word boundaries or uh, sentences or whatever. It has, uh, what else it got? A disable auto correction, you know, where as you're typing and it's, uh, it's got line limit. So normally these text fields are one line, but you could say line limit two and they could be two line text fields. Uh, it even has really powerful things like text content type, like address city, and then it's looking and providing escape completion for the user, assuming that this is a city in an address. So a lot of stuff there to look up. Again, I can't go over it all, but check the documentation for all the view modifiers that would apply to a text. And let's see what this looks like. And we're going to go here and we're going to edit. Oh, there it is, add emojis. I'm going to tap in here and let's bring up the emoji keyboard. Yeah, we'll add some emojis here. These emojis right there. And notice it's adding them to the model as I type them. See how it's adding them right to the model there? Again, that's happening because Palette Editor is editing a palette that is a binding back to the model. So let's add the remove emojis, then we'll be done with this. Um, I'm, we're time constrained, so I'm just going to have this code be a code snippet. So you can go take a look at this later when I post the code. And so I'm going to add this remove emojis section. So we have these three uh, sections. Oh, we have something else going on here. What do we got? All right, now we should be able to do this. Yeah, there it is. Showing on our animal faces. By the way, if we wanted to see different heights, how it would look. Maybe we would take our preview and create two of them. And one of them would have a height of 600. And maybe we would show different emojis there. You now we can see both of those. It looks short, it looks taller, different content. So it's really nice to be able to have multiple previews with different uh, configuration to see what your UI might look like. All right. Last time we need to edit here. There it is. Go around. Let's say we remove this expletive guy, remove the scream guy, funky, gone, and again, editing it all in the model directly. Okay, let's move on to doing the manager. We have the manager here. This big window is going to have this little editable uh, list and also the ability to navigate to this other thing over here. We're going to dive right into creating that. This is on yet another view. This time we'll make sure it's in the right place. It is Palette Manager, I'm going to call this. This manages all my palettes at once. 
since it's all my palettes, I'm definitely going to need my store. So this is environment object bar store, my palette store. It's going to be injected in just like it was injected into through my chooser. It's injected here into my manager as well. And the body of this is a list of things. And so I'm going to show you another powerful four letters in all of Swift, which is list. So a list, kind of like a V stack but it puts it in a nice ordered scrollable thing with little lines separating it and all that. And it's gonna support wonderful things like being able to do this edit mode and move things around and all that. So list, definitely one of the more powerful views also along with form uh, in Swift UI. It's easy to use. All you do is do a for each inside of it of all the things you want. And we wanna show a line for every one of our palettes. And for each one, uh, let's do a UI, which is a little V stack with the name of the palette. And we'll also just show the emojis for the palette. And I want this to be aligned, uh, lined up with on the leading edge, depending on my language, whether I come from the left or the right. That's all I need to do to get that palette manager up there, or we'll have to add all the things like editing in a minute here. Let's do the preview on this one. And notice when we try this, we get cannot preview. And if you press this little I, it says it crashed due to missing environment. Oh, look at that. It's looking for environment object, but in the preview world, it doesn't get it from the app. So the previewer has to provide it itself by saying environment object. It has to do the injection itself. So let's create again, a palette store named preview and inject that in. And now we can see it here. Uh, also, another thing is we could do the same trick here where we create a fixed size. I'll show you another kind of cool trick you can do with this is to go here and inspect and just pick a device that's a little better sized, like maybe an iPhone 8. And I can zoom in on it. And the advantage of doing this is you can actually put it in live mode, which you can't do when you have it being a fixed size. But here it's in live mode and I can actually scroll it around. I'm even going to be able to navigate once we put the navigation in here. Let's go make it so we can make this appear from our palette chooser. Go up to our context menu. Let's add it at the bottom here. Manager. Found a kind of a cool image for that. And here I'm going to do this same way that we put things up using a bool, but I'm going to call it managing. And so whenever this managing is true, our palette manager is going to be on screen. I'm going to use a sheet to put this up. That's the one that makes just the big rectangle. It doesn't really make sense to do a popover. So since I'm not doing a popover, it doesn't really matter where I put this sheet. I'm going to put it next to this other popover just to keep them together. But you can make a good argument that maybe we should be putting this on the palette control button because it's the thing that brings this up. But again, it doesn't really matter too much here. Again, we passed a binding to that managing. And in here, we're just going to put up our palette manager. Okay, so our manager, we're just going to say managing equals true so that we are managing. And so then when managing is true, then the palette manager should be showing here. There it is. It looks very similar to this one over here. And notice this one has a little title over here. And also this one over here, when I tap, it navigates. So let's go get this navigation working so that when we tap on one, it shows us the palette editor that we created earlier. When you have a list of items, like we have in our palette manager right here, and you want to be able to tap on them to navigate. All you have to do is wrap the line, that each line in the list, just wrap it with a navigation link. Navigation link takes two arguments, at least. It can take some other arguments, which we're not really going to get into today. But the first one is the destination. This is the view you want it to go to when you tap on it. So for us, it's palette editor. 
And palette editor takes an argument, palette, this is a binding to a palette, and that is dollar sign, our stores palettes, subscripted by this palette. Palette is passed in here. And this is going to again use that thing I added that looks up this thing by an identifiable here. And then it just wants to know what view tap on causes the link. And in our case, we're going to tap on one of the lines in the row of the list. Now, when I do this, we can see that it has changed something. It puts a little caret there that says, when you tap on this, it's going to navigate. But everything got grayed out. All these links are disabled. Why are these links disabled? Well, because navigation links only work when they're inside a navigation view. The navigation view and navigation link go together. And if you have a view that is not inside of a navigation view and it has a navigation link, it's not going to work. Now, as soon as I added a navigation view, a couple of things happened. One, I got more room at the top. And that's actually for a title that can fit up there. We'll see that in a second. But also, these all stopped being disabled. And if I tap on it, ah, it did it. Simple as that. So that was really easy to get that to go over to a palette editor editing this palette. Now, when we're over here and we're editing, this is editing it in the model because, look, that's the binding we passed. We passed a binding into our model for that palette. So this is going to be editing that in directly in our model. Now, what about this space at the top we have up here? That's for a title. Where does that title come from? Well, navigation view gets it from whatever view it's showing down here. So now it's showing this list. Okay, that's this list is what's showing down there. But when I tap on here, now it's showing a palette editor here. So you put the title on each of these views. The list gets a title, and then the editor gets a title. So let's put it on the editor first. So I'm going to go over to the palette editor, and I'm going to go up to its main form right here. I'm going to use this modifier, navigation title. You just give it a string, let's say edit palette name. That is going to be the title of this palette editor. All palette editors, that will be their title. And then let's go back to our manager and let's give a title to this list right here. So let's we'll say dot navigation title manage palettes. And resume. There's mallet manage palettes here, edit faces in here, edit weather here. One thing I don't think we need though is this really huge title right up here, this really, really tall title. This little smaller one is good enough. We can control that as well by just going down here and saying that our navigation this title display mode is inline makes this smaller one and much more appropriate for the places we're going to be using this, which is in that manager sheet that we bring up from the context menu. Very nice. And see the title then is inlined up here. Next, we want to be able to edit this uh, list, I have a little edit button up here and then delete things and move them around. But to do that, I'm first going to take a moment to talk a little bit about environment variables. I'm gonna do it with color scheme. So when you go into preview, for example, down here, and you say dot preferred color scheme dark, it changes our previewer over here to be in dark mode. What if you wanted to do something differently in your view when you're in dark mode? Like maybe when I'm in dark mode, I want this faces font there to be really, really big versus smaller when it's in light mode. How would I know I'm in dark mode here? I do that by getting an at sign environment variable. So at sign environment, which has nothing to do with at sign environment object, you give it an argument, which is the path to which thing you're interested in, like our color scheme, for example. These paths are found by going in the documentation, 
and looking up environment values. There's environment values. Look down here, lots and lots of them. Okay, here's color scheme, for example. It tells you color scheme is an enum with black dot light and dot dark. Uh, control size, whether your controls are large or small. Uh, it's about database access here. Uh, default line spacing, text things, auto correction. These are all things that are part of your environment. One of them, for example, is your edit mode. That's whether you're in that editing mode where you can delete rows and move them around. Uh, that one's a little tricky. It's a binding to an enum. Uh, well, there's only a couple of them that are bindings. That one and also presentation mode uh, is a binding. But these you have to do a little specially, and I'll show you how to do that uh, in a second. When you get environment variable, you're essentially creating a var, which is going to have the values from this color scheme. So now I know my color scheme in here. It's right here. So I could, for example, do something like the name of my palette dot font. If my color scheme equals dot dark, then I'm going to have it be large title. Otherwise, let's have it be dot caption and be really tiny. If we resume, we're in dark mode. So our font is really big. If we change our color scheme to light mode, then it gets really tiny. Now, these environment variables, not only can you get them like this, you can set them for a certain view. They're called environment variables because they're the environment in which a certain view is working. So, for example, if I want to be in light mode, but I want this list only to be in dark mode, I can go like this, dot environment, dot color scheme, to dot dark. And now my list is in dark mode. You can see that the rest of my UI up where the navigation view is is still in light mode. This is in dark mode. This is injecting into the environment, actually overriding the environment just for the view you send it to. I'm sending it to this view right here, right? That's the view modifier I'm doing it on. Now there's one environment variable that's very interesting to set, which is the edit mode. It's interesting to set because it is a binding. So we can bind the edit mode to a local variable in our view. And then for all the editing that's going on in our view, we own that variable. It'll be at sign state in our view. So if we look up edit mode in the documentation, you'll see that it's just a little enum. It has uh, active and inactive cases there. And it even has a little bar that will tell you if it's in an active editing state. So I'm just creating a local version of this in an at sign state, and then I'm injecting a binding to it into this list view. So this list is going to use this binding to find out whether it's in edit mode. So right now it's not, but if I change this to active, then it would be in edit mode. So I want to be able to set this edit mode right here using a little button here that says edit done, edit done. Remember that? Well, that button is actually provided by Swift UI, and I can put it on my screen using another view modifier called toolbar. So if I say toolbar edit button, it's going to put this magic edit button right here into the toolbar. Now, what does this thing do? Simple. It toggles the value of edit mode in its environment. So when you do this environment, it's setting it not only for this list, but since I'm putting it down here after the toolbar, it's setting it for the toolbar as well. So now both the list and this edit button are looking at the same edit mode, which is bound to my edit mode. So now the edit button knows what the edit mode is, the list knows, and I know because it's a local state bar for me. So I could also do things here differently when I'm in edit mode or not. So just like I'm checking the color screen, maybe when I'm in edit mode equals active, then I use a large title versus a caption. So here when I enter edit mode, it gets large. And when I exit edit mode, it goes back to small. So this is a way of, this is why they do the binding because I can create my local state. So I know what the edit mode is. And then I'm just injecting a binding so that these guys are all using the same edit mode. All right, now, 
I go into edit mode, no delete, no moving. How come I can't delete or move when I'm in edit mode? Well, that's because this list, this for each, does not know how to do deleting. We have not told it how to delete a store palette or how to move them around. So how are we going to teach this to do it? Well, this is all about the for each because the for each is the one that is managing these views in here. So for each has a nice modifier called on delete, and it takes something called an index set. An index set is exactly what it sounds like, a set of indexes into this array right here. And it's asking you to tell me the code necessary to delete these things. Now, when we go in edit mode, you're gonna see there's only one dot for each one. So we can only delete one thing at a time, but this is a set because who knows, someday there might be a way to select multiple of them to delete. We don't wanna have this code not work in that case. But in any case, we're going to do this delete by using a nice method in array, store.palettes, remove at offsets index set. This is an array method, works perfectly fine in array, and it's going to remove all those things. And similarly for moving, we can say on move, it takes the index set of selected things and also a new offset to move them to. And we can do the same thing. There's a nice array thing here called move from offsets, the index set to offset the new offset. So by doing these, we've taught for each how to do delete and move. Now, if we resume and go into edit mode, we see these extra controls to do this stuff like deletion. Let's go ahead and take off our little edit mode font setting there so it looks good and go back and run this. And we go here and we manage and go to edit mode ah, and let's delete animal faces gone let's move music right up to the top when we're done we click we can do our navigation view kind of got it all going here in this particular view i'm going to show you one other thing that you're going to need to know for your homework which is how do i make it so that when i'm in edit mode and I tap on here, we know that tapping isn't going to navigate, but what if I want to do something else? Like, for example, in your homework, bring up an editor for a theme. Well, tapping in here just does nothing right now, but I can't really just say on tap gesture, do something. If I put this in here, then it's not going to work in navigation mode because this is going to override the navigation link, getting the click on there. So the trick to this is just to create a little tap gesture for yourself, some gesture, and it's a tap gesture that on ended does something. And here, only put this gesture on here when you are in edit mode active. So dot gesture, edit mode equals dot active, then you're doing the tap, otherwise nil, no gesture. So when this gesture is nil, it's not going to interfere with this navigation link. And when you're in edit mode, then it's going to do tap and you can do whatever you need to do down here to bring up your user interface to edit your themes. Let's try and squeeze in one more little feature here, which is another environment thing here called presentation mode. So the presentation mode, it's a binding just like edit mode is, but you don't actually usually create a little at sign state and bind to it. You just access the binding. And one thing this can do that's really nice is let you dismiss yourself if you've been presented in a popover or a sheet. So I just wanted to show you quickly how to do that. And my UI for that is that I'm gonna add another button over here called close. And close is going to close myself but only if I've been presented, only if I'm on screen because I'm in a sheet or popover or something. So how do we add that close button? It's, this is the toolbar up here. So we've already got one thing in our toolbar, this edit button. This, when you put things in the toolbar, by default, they're gonna go up here to the right, but we can specify the position, but only if 
we make our toolbar, instead of being a view builder with just a list of views like this, actually be a list of toolbar items. Now, toolbar items are really easy to create from views, so it's easy to turn our edit button into a toolbar item. But when you create a toolbar item, you can also specify an argument here like the placement. The placement lets you say where you want it. So I want this one, navigation bar leading. Remember, this is the leading edge if I'm in a left to right language, and this is the leading edge if not. And of course, the edit button would be swapped in that case as well. So I'm specifying where I want this thing. And the view that I'm going to put up there is going to have an if in it, which is that if the presentation mode, that's this environment variable that we got above, and it's a binding, so I'm going to have to look at its wrapped value, which is kind of weird. It's pretty unusual for us to have to look in, reach into a binding uh, or any uh, property wrapper and find its wrapped value. Usually it's being shown for us, but I'm not accessing this as an at sign binding. I'm accessing it through at sign environment here. So this is just a binding bar. So I'm required to do this wrapped value. The wrapped value, the presentation mode that's in there, has a function called dismiss that can dismiss, but it also has something called is presented. And that tells me whether I've been presented. If I have been presented, then I'm going to create a button called close. And when it's touched on, I'm going to use that same presentation mode wrapped value to dismiss myself. The only thing about this is I probably don't want this on iPad because on the iPad, I can just tap away somewhere else to dismiss myself. I don't really need a close button. On the iPhone, I can actually swipe down to dismiss a sheet uh, or a popover, but it, sometimes it's nice to be able to actually click close. Or maybe I, in some other application, I want to be able to dismiss myself using some logic, some decision I have to make, and oh, I got to dismiss myself because of it. But I'm just going to have this also be conditional, not just on whether we've been presented, but whether we're presented not on the iPad. We'll do that by adding this little and to this, which is UI device current user interface idiom does not equal iPad. So this is how you can kind of tell whether you're on an iPad or an iPhone. The other one here is dot phone. It's a convenient way. We don't usually have to have our UIs be conditional like this. They just adapt nicely to the iPhone or the iPad. Uh, but in this case, since I don't want this close button on the iPad, I'm going to put this, add this in here. But I'm going to temporarily take this out just so that we can test and make sure this is working. There's our close button right there, and we tap on it. And it clears it out of there. All right, the last thing I want to show, I know we're definitely going to be over time, but this is an important one to show, is alerts. Okay, we've been seeing how to put up sheets and popovers. How about alerts? You want to alert the user something went wrong. To do this, I'm going to go back to my document view. I want to put up an alert when the background image, when you drag something into your background over here, you drag something in, and it's no good. It's a bad URL. I can't, I can't download an image from it. So I'm going to put up an alert on the screen that says bad URL and tells you the URL. So to do this, it's kind of a two-step thing. First step is I have to go and detect when that state happens. So that's going to happen in my document, right, in my view model, because it's the thing that's going off and doing this background fetching. So it's, it's going to have to be the one to detect that that problem has happened. I'm going to do that by adding another case to my fetch status, which is case failed. And we're going to see what URL failed. All I need to do here is just set this. And uh, let's see, this is where I'm doing my fetching. I did the fetch. Here's where I'm creating the image. Well, if I get all the way to the bottom of this and I don't have a background image, so if my background image is nil, then I failed. So I'm going to say that my background image fetch status equals dot failed. I'll give you the URL I was trying to get right there. This is the only time I'll fail. Get all the way down to the end here. And couldn't get it, couldn't create the image. That's all we need to do in our model. We're just updating our fetch status to 
when we failed, we'll let you know it failed. So over in our view, we need to watch for that and put up an alert when it happens. Now changing that, adding that dot failed URL actually caused a problem here that this equals equals that I'm doing to see if we're fetching, so I can put up that little spinner, is now saying that this is no longer equatable. Huh. Well, that's because in our document, we added a case here with an associated value. And when you do that, you're gonna to have to mark this equatable to force Swift to go off and implement this for you, which you can do. As long as this is equatable, it can figure it out. But you still have to mark it as equatable. So that's something to know there. When you make a enum that has a uh, associated value, you need to mark it equatable if you want it to be equatable. All right, back to our view here. That'll fix that problem. Let's talk about how we put an alert up. Well, just like we have dot sheet and we have dot pop over, we also have dot alert. And it works very similarly. I'm going to have an item, which is going to be something that can be nil. I'll call it alert to show. And when that thing is not nil, it's going to call this closure, and give me the alert to show back at me. And here I have to return an alert capital A alert. So let's go look in the documentation what an alert is. It's a little different there. Notice I'm returning an alert. I'm not returning a view there like I would with sheet and popover. So alert, it represents an alert, it says, and it shows you some examples how to build it. This is what an alert looks like. And the arguments here, you specify essentially the title of the alert, the message on the alert, any buttons that it might have on it. So it's a very simple little struct right here that represents an alert. So we have to return one of those right here. And we're gonna do that uh, in a second. But first I need this alert to show. Again, it has to be something that's identifiable and something that can be nil. I'm going to say at sign state private var alert to show. And it's got to be something that can be an optional. I'm going to make it be something I created called an identifiable alert. So identifiable alert, let's go look at what that is over in my utilities view. It is the simplest little struct you can imagine. It's an identifiable struct, so it has a var ID, which just is any random string that you want. And the other var is a little function that makes that alert, a little alert thing. So this is really convenient. So if you want to create one of these identifiable alerts, which you wanna do, anytime we have to show an alert, I'm gonna create a little private funk, which I'm gonna call show background image fetch failed alert, which takes uh, the URL that failed. And to do this, I just have to say alert to show equals one of these identifiable alerts. And remember, there's two arguments. The first one is the ID. So I need a unique ID that really identifies this particular alert. And so I'm gonna say fetch failed uh, plus that URL as a string. Absolute string is how you turn a URL into a string. So that should be pretty darn unique uh, identifier for that alert. And then I need to provide the alert. So that's alert colon and then the alert. So that's alert. That's it, that's my alert. So now I have set this alert to show to something not nil, and that's gonna cause this alert to appear. So in here, this alert to show, the alert we wanna return is just the alert to show dot alert function. Alert to show is that identifiable alert. So this is a really kind of general way to do alerts, and I, I give you this identifiable alert because it's just a simple way to do this. Oh, that's right, our buttons have to be either default buttons or cancel buttons, so we'll make that be a default button. Now all we have to do is call this show background fetch failed alert when that happens, when we find that out. Now how do we find out that our view model has set this variable right here to be dot failed? Well, we're gonna do something we already know about, dot on change of. We're gonna look at our documents background image fetch status. And when it changes, we get the status, and I'm gonna switch on it. And in the case that is that failed, 
I'll grab the URL out of there and call show background image fetch failed with that URL. And if the status changed to anything else, it should do nothing. Right? Simple as that. So on change of again strikes again, really a way to good way to monitor what's going on in your view model or just looking at a bar and when it changes, kaboom. All right, let's see if this works. I'll try dragging in our favorite image. This should work. It does. Now let's drag in like this. I think it's some text or something. This is like a website. It should not be an image. Oh, background image fetch. Couldn't load image from this place. Okay. Go back to something like this one. It works. Go to another thing that's a website. Oh, it doesn't work. Generally, you don't want to overuse alerts. I, people sometimes, every time they want to talk to the user, they just throw an alert up. Alerts really are for somewhat asynchronous things, things that just happen out of nowhere, network failures or something like this. They're not for normal communication with your user. Hopefully that's in your UI normally somehow. So don't get into the habit of just constantly putting an alert every time you want to say something to your, to your user. Okay, whew, we covered a lot of ground today. I'm going to take the time, even though we're over time, to go back and just review all the things we did. So we learned how to pass our view model using this environment object mechanism by injecting it into the top level and just having it percolate all the way down to our palette chooser, for example, and also to our palette manager here it also used it we learned that we should probably mark our uh, state at the top level with state object so that we can always find our sources of truth by searching for at sign state we did a little bit of animation review by doing this roll transition right here and we learned the special little trick of using dot id to make a view essentially identifiable and unique so that it more comes and goes and can transition as it changes. Learned how to do context menus, of course, both by attaching them to some uh, button in this case, but also having a context menu that's brought up from inside another context menu here by having this go to menu be inside our context menu. Probably the most important thing we learned all day was bindings. We learned how to bind information from our views all the way back in to our model. We also learned how to use bindings to, for example, bind into the text, the text field. And we also use bindings to decide when things would appear on the screen. Sheets and popovers were bound to Booleans and values that could be nil or not. Now, binding takes a little bit of experience to get used to using it, but it's super important to understand because without bindings, we can't have these single sources of truth. We end up passing the data around and copying it. So we don't want that. So binding is really important to understand. And there's a lot of Swift UI like text field you simply can't use if you don't understand how bindings work. We learned about some very powerful views that are so simple like form, which puts everything in a nice form and also list which makes nice line separated lists, but also supports doing things like these on deletes and moves on your for each inside of it. Not to mention navigation view and navigation link, including being able to set the title and the display mode and all that. And we learned that we set the title on the thing inside the navigation view. We don't set the navigation title on the navigation view itself. It's on the list or the palette editor inside of it. We saw briefly how to put a toolbar uh, button up into our navigation view just by saying dot toolbar here. And we learned about this special edit button that changes the edit mode in its environment, but you have to create your own edit mode and inject it into its environment. And it wants to be in the same environment as the list. Although you'd never want to put this up here because now you set the environment of the list to point to your edit mode, but oops, this guy is not in that environment. So it would be setting uh, the edit mode of a different uh, in a different environment. We saw how simple it was to add deleting and moving capabilities to a for each inside of a list. 
and how to use OnChange. Both in our palette editor, we used OnChange so that when the add emojis were happening, right, we're typing in add emojis, we were adding the emojis. And back in our emoji art document view, we used it to keep an eye on our background image fetch status that our view model is changing right there so that we can put up an alert if it failed. And we learned how to put alerts up, which are very similar to putting sheets and popovers up, which is the first thing we really learned. So in your homework, you're going to have to do a lot of these things. You're going to be definitely putting sheets up. You're going to be doing navigation. You're going to have to do this uh, edit mode over here uh, that we did in the manager. As with most stuff in this course, you learn it by doing. I can sit here in the demo and show it to you and you can say, oh yeah, that makes sense. I understand that. But until you go down to type it in and try and make it work, you're not really going to understand it. The other thing is I've only just scratched the surface on these things. There's a lot more things that you can do with Navigation Link. For example, it has more arguments than just the destination uh, and the view. And you can specify other things to find out which thing is selected and things like that. And just obviously you can see this demo has already run over. So there's no chance to go cover all that stuff. You're gonna to have to learn it from the documentation and other sources. Uh, and that's a lot of what your final project is for as well, is to really dive deep into more of these APIs. So that's it for this week. And next week, you're gonna be finishing off your assignment six and starting to think about your final project. So good luck with that. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.